Hey everyone, in this lecture I'm going to be looking at the O-ring data from the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion and providing uh, an open bugs and our analysis of those data with some cool graphics. Uh, this follows the analysis that's shown in your textbook. Um, I hope that this will help you see how you can use open bugs in R to implement a logistic regression on an easy data set. Um, your textbook also has a trauma data set, which is a multivariate regression um, or a regression with multiple covariates. Um, that's going to give you some other interesting things to look at in terms of uh, analyzing data with logistic regression models Bayesian. But in this lecture, I'm going to just focus on the challenger data talk about how to do this in uh, R and in OpenBugs, and look at what we need to do to find priors to model, priors for our model, subject matter expert priors for our model, how we need to do that in this context. Uh, so let's get started. You may already be familiar with the O-ring data. It's one of the most famous data sets and statistics for doing binomial regression. If you're not, though, let's do a quick introduction here. So you may or may not be familiar with the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion uh, from the mid-80s. On January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger crashed after takeoff. Um, what happened was the shuttle exploded, and the explosion was caused by the failure of these pieces in the shuttle called O-rings. Uh, they're little rubber rings. Well, they're not necessarily little, um, but they're rubber rings. And uh, my memory is that they um, they sort of connect the fuel to the uh, where the fuel gets burned to cause propulsion for the shuttle. And so these failed. Uh, that allowed things to happen that shouldn't happen. And at the end of the day, that caused the shuttle to explode as it was taking off. Um, the data set we're going to look at here is from the space shuttle program from back in the late 70s, I think in the 80s, um, and O-ring failures at various temperatures. And so what are the data that we have? Well, let's take a look. Um, we've got flight numbers. There were 23 flights prior to the Challenger explosion, 23 space shuttle flights prior to the Challenger explosion. And so these are the these are data on the temperatures at which those launches occurred and whether any O-ring failures, there are multiple O-rings on the space shuttle, whether any O-ring failures at all were recorded during that flight. Um, so you'll notice that uh, failure is a zero one variable, either one or more uh, O-rings failed or none of the O-rings failed. So we've got a one anytime one or more of the O-rings failed on a previous flight. And we also have the temperature at which the launch happened, uh, like I said. so. What we would like to do is we'd like to see if we can improve our prediction of whether or not O-rings are going to fail by including covariate information on temperature. Um, spoiler alert, we can, and we'll talk about that some uh, as we go on. So the model we're looking at, we're going to be looking at a binomial regression model. And so we've been talking about this before. We've got, let me pull up a pen here. We've got our theta, which is going to be serving as our probability of a failure. And logit of theta is going to be beta 1 plus beta 2 x mark i. So x mark i here is going to be our temperature. And our x matrix, our x vector for a particular observation, is going to just be 1 for an intercept term and the temperature. And our beta then is going to be a two by one vector where we have an intercept term or what uh, functions as an intercept term in a logistic regression model. Our beta one and then our beta two which corresponds to the covariate for temperature. We can write this model as we've been discussing as logit of theta is equal to xi prime beta and logit of theta i is equal to xi prime beta and then our y data, our failure data, 
will follow a binomial one theta i distribution. which is what we have right down here. Okay, so we will use this data and we wanna do an analysis on it. Now the textbook has some nice graphs associated with this data. I'm going to just sort of skip through them real quick so you can get a look at them from the textbook. Um, here we go. So this is a plot of beta one and beta two in this model. And you can see that in a particular setup here, we'll talk about this in a bit, uh, beta 1 and beta 2 are very highly correlated. And then in a second setup, they're not very highly correlated. Um, they're still somewhat correlated. So one thing we want to do when we're uh, running a binomial regression is we want to center any continuous covariates. Not centering continuous covariates can lead to this sort of uh, strong correlation between the regression components between the regression parameters. Centering makes this, um, centering gives us this. Why do we prefer this to this? Well, we should be getting the same predictions out with the model regardless of which of these we're using. The nice thing about centering is these are some very odd looking distributions. I mean, when we're doing, uh, Bayesian computation, we need to be sampling from the distributions that we're looking at here. And so the uh, the lighter distribution is the prior distribution for our beta parameters. The darker distribution is the posterior distribution for our parameters. It's much easier to sample from a distribution that is less correlated than it is from one that's more strongly correlated, uh, or to sample well from it. And so centering helps us sample better. So that's one thing we'll be trying to recreate. And we will also be trying to recreate down here this graph of predicted failure probabilities at different temperatures. To do this, I have some R code I will make available in the comments to this video. And let's go through that R code and get a look at what we're going to be doing. So this is going to be a standard uh, open bugs analysis done through R2 open bugs, and I'll do some plots using ggplot. Uh, I have my normal setup here for R2 open bugs. I set a working directory. I set my model file names for the two models I'm going to be using because I'm going to look at this both centered and uncentered. And then I need to tell it where my bugs lives, my bugs program lives. I need to give it a working directory to work in. And then I'm going to do this with uh, just a burn-in of 1,000 and 10,000 posterior iterates. So let's start out by loading in some data. My O-ring data is going to come from this CSV file, oringdata.csv. And I'll load in the data from there. You can see here that uh, we've still got temperatures and failures. Temperatures are continuous. Uh, they seem to be running from about 53 to, I've got an 81. Um, so the low 50s to the low 80s is about the range that I've got data on. And then my failures, I've just got some 0, 1 data in there. I load in my data, and I'm going to have... Um, my variable names changed over so that they're easier, easier to play around with in my model statement. I do my standard bugs loading of um, my data, my initial values for parameters that I need to deal with and the parameters that I want to monitor. And I'll talk in just a little bit about uh, how we're going to do prior parameters in this instance for this uh, logistic regression. And then I will run my, I will run open bugs, get my posterior iterates into R, and then I can play around with them in R. So to start, let's take a look at the model file. Our initial model file doesn't look too complicated. I've got a loop going from 1 to n, where n is my number of uh, response variables, my number of previous shuttle launches. 
And so for each y in that data set, for each of the previous failure variables, uh, 0 or 1, those guys are going to be binomial with one observation. I do probability and then number of trials when I do this in open bugs. So probability of success for yi, or probability of an o-ring failure is what success means in this case. Probability of an o-ring failure is going to be theta i, and then I'm going to have just one shuttle launch that I'm dealing with there. And so how do I know what theta i is? Well, in bugs I can write logit of theta i is beta 1 plus beta 2 times temp i. And so this connects up my, well this links, this is my link function, this links my probability to my x beta equation. Uh, remember I've got an intercept term and then I've got a uh, slope term sort of, except slope has sort of a, an odd meaning when I'm considering it in logistic regression. But when I think about this as a linear model, I have an intercept term and I have a slope term and the slope depends on my covariate temperature. Now, this is the more interesting part. So for j equals 1 to 2, I'm going to look at tilde theta j, and that's going to be d beta aj dj. This is my prior statement right here. So my priors are going to be on tilde theta, and I'll talk more about what this is in a little bit. And then beta, beta 1, my intercept term, is going to be related to the tilde thetas through this equation. Beta 2, my slope term, is going to be related to the tilde thetas through this equation. So let's go back to the textbook real quick and see where those equations are coming from. So thinking about how we've done priors in the past, I have two parameters, theta 1 and theta 2, or sorry, beta 1 and beta 2, two parameters, beta 1 and beta 2. And I want two pieces of information for each of those parameters to give me a sufficiently flexible family of distributions um, to give a good prior for those parameters. But I don't like thinking in terms of beta 1 and beta 2. So what can I do? Well, instead, I can think about two example cases, x1 tilde and x2 tilde. Now, what are these guys? x1 tilde and x2 tilde are two hypothetical launches. I've got a hypothetical launch at 55 degrees and a hypothetical launch at 75 degrees. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a subject matter expert what they think is likely to happen when I launch at 55 degrees and when I launch at 75 degrees. And so the information I get down here in this paragraph So for the O-ring data, the priors on theta tilde 1 and theta tilde 2, and these are the probability of O-ring failure, of at least one O-ring failing at, for a launch at 55 degrees, and the probability of at least one O-ring failure for a launch at 75 degrees, these are chosen to have modes of 1 and 0, respectively. So my mode, my best guess, is that I will have a failure at 55 degrees, and I won't have a failure at 75 degrees. And then the additional information I'm going to have here is that the probability of theta tilde 1 being greater than a half is two-thirds. So remember, this is, I think the most likely thing is there will be a failure. And I'm saying that I've got a total of two-thirds of the mass in my distribution on, my prior distribution on theta tilde 1. I've got two-thirds of the mass greater than 0.5. Same sort of thing with theta tilde 2, the launch at 75 degrees, two-thirds of the mass is less than 0.5, and I think the most likely thing is that I'm not going to have a uh, failure there. So I can translate these into two beta priors, and if you think about what I've just described, this is symmetric. So one of these has mode at, the first one of these has mode at 1, and two-thirds of the mass is above a half. Second one has mode at zero and two thirds of the mass is below a half. So I'm gonna have two nice looking beta priors. My beta prior for theta tilde one is gonna be a 1.61. That's gonna have the two properties I described. And my theta prior for, or my theta tilde two prior is going to be a beta one, 
which is going to have the properties I described. And so if we think about these in data augmentation terms, this is kind of like saying for the um, theta tilde one, for the probability of a failure, an O-ring failure if I launch at 55 degrees, this is like saying that I have seen 1.6 previous observations and I've gotten 1.6 successes and one failure. So I'm not contributing a whole lot of information. Um, on the 75 degree hypothetical launch, I've got the, again, 2.6 prior observations, but now I've got one O-ring failure and 1.6 non-O-ring failure cases. Um, now, what can I do with these? I want a prior on the betas, right? So what I can do is I can induce a prior on the betas. Now, what does this look like? So theta tilde is my vector of those two theta tildes. So I've got theta tilde for my 55 degree launch and I've got theta tilde for my 75 degree launch. And those theta tildes are the same as the logistic function applied to an x beta for that scenario. And so what's my x beta going to look like for the first scenario, for the um, 55 degree scenario? Well, I'm going to have an intercept term and I'm launching at 55 degrees. And so my x beta for that term is going to be beta 1, my intercept, plus beta 2 times 55. My x beta for the 75 degree launch is going to be beta 1 plus beta 2 times 75. And then I'm going to use the logistic function on that, e to the x beta over 1 plus e to the x beta. That gets me the theta, the theta tildes. So how do I go from the theta tildes back to the betas? Well, if I've got my x matrix and I've got my inverse function, which in this case is going to be the logit function, since I'm using the logistic function to move from x beta to f. So I can take the logit function applied to theta tilde and left multiply by the inverse matrix of the x tildes. Now, I'm going to want basically one piece of information for each beta, or I'm going to want one um, hypothetical observation for each beta, right? And then each hypothetical observation has its two pieces of information that are going into it to give me a beta prior. So this x matrix should be square. Um, we can worry about cases where it's not, where we have partial prior information, but I'm not going to do that in this lecture. Um, but if I have a square x tilde matrix, then I've got one row for each element of beta. And so I've got one piece of information in X, in my hypothetical X, to cover the information in each beta. So that's the sort of setup that we want. If we look at the O-ring data down here at the bottom, this is what that's going to look like. So using matrix inversion with a 2 by 2 matrix, I'm going to have logit of theta tilde left multiplied by this matrix. And if I go back over to my model statement, this is what we're looking at with the model statement. We have beta 1 is 75 twentieths times logit tilde theta 1 minus 55 twentieths times logit tilde theta 2, and beta 2 is minus 1 twentieth times logit tilde theta 1 plus 1 twentieth times logit tilde theta 2. So this is how we transform that tilde theta information, the prior information on those two hypothetical cases, into prior information on the betas. So let's go ahead and run this in R and see what happens. Oh, I'm running the wrong one. I'm running the second one. Um, wait. Looks like I forgot to run my earlier code. So beginning at the top, we'll load the libraries, set the working directory information. We'll load in the data. And now let's take a look at what happens when we run bugs. So this should just take a few seconds. <laughs> 
waiting for my carrot down here. And here we go. So we've got the betas. Um, I can look at head beta. So I've got information on beta here. The first column is my information on um, beta 1. My second column is my information on beta 2. When I say my information, what do I mean? These are posterior iterates. So these are samples from the posterior distribution of beta 1, samples from the posterior distribution of beta 2, and dim beta. So I've got 10,000 observations for each of these two parameters. If I scroll down, so in the book, we had a plot of the prior and the posterior for data. For beta, if I want to remake this, what do I need to do? I have prior and posterior information for beta. I've just gotten that from open bugs. But, or sorry, I have posterior information from beta, for beta. I've just gotten that from open bugs. But if I want to plot the prior, I'm also going to need to get prior information. And so I'm just going to sample out of the prior. I'm going to sample from the prior for theta 1. I'm going to sample the same number of observations from the prior for theta 1, for theta tilde 1, I should say. Uh, that I have for the betas, and I'm going to use the values for the prior for theta tilde 1 that I've already talked about. Same thing, prior for theta tilde 2, I'm just going to sample directly from a beta using the same parameters that I already have looked at. And then when I have the random sample from the prior for theta tilde 1 and the prior for theta tilde 2, I will do just what I was doing in the open bugs code, and I will transform those values into values on beta 1 and beta 2. So I, what I'm doing is I'm inducing a prior on beta 1 and beta 2 by doing that transformation. And because I've got direct draws from the distribution for theta tilde 1 and theta tilde 2, this is going to just turn into draws from the prior distribution for beta 1 and beta 2. Okay, so let's get those draws for the beta 1 and beta 2 under the prior. And then I'll construct a data frame because I want to go into ggplot to get some nice graph graphics here. And let's do the ggplot on this. And what we see is something very much like what we were seeing under in the textbook. Uh, I've got the dotted lines here showing the prior distribution for theta 1 and theta 2 and the solid lines are the posterior distribution for theta 1 and theta 2. And so you can see that this is a pretty strongly correlated plot here. Um, doesn't look quite as strongly correlated as it does in the textbook. I'm perfectly happy with what I've got here. It's probably just a scaling issue. Uh, but we can see that, yes, this is definitely, there's a strong correlation going on or a strong negative correlation going on between beta 1 and beta 2. So like I was saying before, um, it's not particularly easy to sample out of these distributions with strong correlations between them because I need to sample a beta 1 value and then I need to sample a beta 2 value, a beta 1 value, and then a beta 2 value. Moving through a distribution that is very highly correlated like this is more difficult than moving through a distribution where you don't have this strong a correlation. So let's look at centering the data. To center the data, well, I've got the scale function that I can use in R. And the scale function will take a set of data and it will kick out a new centered set of data. Um, but it comes with a few pieces to it. So let's take a look at this and I'll show you why I'm writing all of this code for it. If I type in well, let's do temp because we have temp from before. This is what temp looks like. Temp is just my raw temperature values. Centered temp, I've got temperature values. Now they're in a vector, but I've also got these two attribute, attribute things down here. So the center that I'm pulling out is about 69.5, and I'm rescaling by a factor of about 7. And I don't want to lose that information because I'm going to need that information when I go do some predictive work in a little bit. Uh, so C temp here is just going to store the centered temperature values. These are my new centered temperature values corresponding to 
the original temperature values. And then I've also stored the center and the scaling parameter. Okay, so I've done that. Now let's run open bugs on the new centered model. Give it a couple seconds and there we go. Uh, what does this new centered model look like, by the way? I should stop for a second and give you a look at that. So I have both the uncentered and the centered model here. The uncentered model is on top, the centered model is on the bottom. And you'll notice that the only difference is I've moved from my original transformation equations, the ones that are given in the book, to induce priors on beta 1 and beta 2 from the tilde theta information to two new functions to induce priors on beta 1 and beta 2 given the tilde theta information. Tilde theta information doesn't change, but what 75 degrees and 55 degrees mean in terms of my rescaled temperature, that's changed. And so that's going to change the whole function here. Um, so this is the rescaling that I need to do to move my prior into the new space. If you don't do this rescaling, your prior is going to give you some very bad results. I know this because I spent probably half an hour today tracking down that issue until I realized what was causing it. So you need to rescale the prior or this is not going to work well. Um, be careful on that. Now let's look at what the plot of the bivariate distribution of beta 1 and beta 2 looks like under the new centered analysis. I'll come over here and again I need to find prior information on theta tilde 1 and theta tilde 2. I'm resampling from them. I could use my old samples, it doesn't matter. Uh, but then I need to find the induced prior iterates for my new centered beta 1 and my new centered beta, beta 2. And then I'll combine up my prior iterates for centered beta 1 and centered beta 2 with my posterior iterates for centered beta 1 and centered beta 2. And I will graph those. And again, this gives us something that looks pretty similar to what we've got in the book. Um, again, it's a little different, but I think that that difference that we're seeing is mostly a matter of how wide this is and the scaling on, um, on the graph. But we've got the prior distribution with the dashed lines here, contour plot of that, and then the posterior distribution down here. And so you can see the posterior distribution has moved a decent amount, and it's certainly clumped up quite a bit relative to the prior distribution that we started with. Uh, we've got some pretty odd shapes here, which I always find interesting looking at this. But remember, we're doing some fairly odd things here, too. We've got a beta prior on tilde theta 1 and tilde theta 2, but we're using some kind of nasty functions to induce what that says about beta 1 and beta 2 directly. And so we get, like I was saying, sort of some interesting shapes here. Okay, so this is our prior and our posterior shown uh, with contour plots for beta 1 and beta 2 when we're looking at the centered analysis. The last thing I want to show you, and then I'll talk about what we're seeing with this data sum, is I want to show you a graph of predictions of failure rates based on a range of temperatures that we could see. So I'm going to predict for temperatures between 32 degrees and 92 degrees. That's how I'm getting these prediction temperatures. I'm going to take 320 to 920. That sequence divide by 10, so I'm going to go in increments of 0.1. Uh, let me give myself a little bit more room here uh, so you can follow along. So increments of 0.1, there we go. And then I have these temperatures. I'm going to need to adjust these temperatures. This is why I was storing the scaling information from before. So for the new centered analysis, I'm not working on the raw temperature scale. I'm working on an adjusted scale. So I'm going to need to subtract off the center of my scaling factor and then I'm going to need to divide by the scaling factor. All right, I'm going to need to subtract off the center 
from the scaling function, and I'm going to need to divide by the scale from the scaling function. That's a better way to say it. So I'm going to get some adjusted temperatures, and then for those adjusted temperatures, I'm going to create a set of predictions based on the posterior iterates that I have. Now, this is one of the odder bits to creating this graph, and I'll come back to this. Why don't I just run this, and then we can discuss what we're looking at here. Okay, so here we go. The solid line is the median of the posterior iterates for these predictions. And the two dotted lines are the 5th percentile down here and the 95th percentile up here for the predictions for the probability of failure. The reason I want to do this graph is now you might remember I said that the data that we have on previous launches, on O ring failures for previous launches, ranges from about 53 degrees around here to about 81 degrees here. And so this range is the range where I've already been observing data. But the Challenger explosion happened after a launch on a particularly cold day. Now, the Challenger shuttle launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida. It's Florida. If you're familiar with your U.S. geography, Florida tends not to get very cold. But this was an unusually cold day in Florida, and my memory is that the temperature at time of launch was around freezing. And you can see here from our median estimate, we would expect that it's almost guaranteed that we're going to see at least one O-ring failure. In point of fact, there were multiple O-ring failures, which is why the uh, space shuttle exploded. And this is why that happened, essentially, because we've got such an extreme probability of having O-rings fail. Um, this is not something that NASA, the, uh, the U.S. Space Agency, was really prepared for, because, like I said, it's a very unusual event to have temperatures that cold in Florida uh, at launch time. And so they did not expect that they were going to see these sorts of failures. This is the, the O-ring data, uh, all of this analysis, analysis of the O-ring data that you're seeing now and that you may have seen before, um, is done, was done because of the explosion. Um, they thought that there might be a relationship between temperature and O-ring failure, but they didn't know what that relationship was. And once you see what the data is saying in terms of logistic regression, it is not at all surprising that this happened. But they didn't know to expect this until they looked at the data. Uh, my memory of the analysis of this event after the fact. Uh, there was a very famous uh, physicist. His name is... I'm forgetting it. Give me just a second. Richard Feynman. Um, Richard Feynman was, a, Feynman was a famous physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. And he was part of the panel investigating the failure of the Challenger space shuttle. Um, and in a televised hearing, he took a small O-ring put it in a glass of water and a glass of ice water and showed just how easily these could fail when they got cold. Um, so one of the more memorable things about the aftermath of the Challenger explosion. Um, like I was saying, at very cold temperatures, O-rings are basically guaranteed to fail. That's what we're finding out here. Let's take a look back at the analysis code and see how we're getting this plot. So like I was saying, we're picking some prediction temperatures, we're rescaling those based on the new centered analysis, and then I want to get a 95% or a 90% interval from the 5th percentile to the 90, 95th percentile. I want to get a 90% interval that I can plot of the probability of O-ring failure. How do I do that? Well, the best way to do that that I've come up with um, but this matches the graph in your book, and I think that th this is a very reasonable way. There might be a more efficient way that I'm missing, but this is a very reasonable way to do it. So I'm going to create a data 
I, I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to assign it null so that I can add more things to it dynamically called prediction probabilities. And what I'm going to do is to save myself a little bit of time, I'm going to shrink the loop a bit here. For i equals 1 to, what is this doing? This is getting me a tenth of my iterates, my posterior iterates. So I'm not going to do this for every posterior iterate. I'm just going to do it for a tenth of them because I'm graphing this, and so that should be about good enough. So for a set of posterior iterates, I'm going to create a new prediction probability. And that new prediction probability, I'm just going to apply the logistic function to intercept plus adjusted temperature times slope. Now remember my adjusted temperature is a vector containing a whole bunch of different temperature values. And so what I'm going to do is for each temperature value I have, 32, 32.1, 32.2, the adjusted version of that. So for each of these temperature values, I'm going to calculate the probability of O-ring failure for a whole set of posterior iterates. So remember, I'm going through this loop for a whole bunch of posterior iterates. So what this is going to do is for each of these prediction temperature values, I'm going to have a posterior sample of probabilities of failure at that temperature value. So this is a prediction problem. I predict at a temperature, and I use my posterior iterates to get myself a range of predictions, and then I identify what is the median of those predictions, what is the 5th percentile of those predictions, and what is the 95th percentile of those predictions. And I'm going to do that for every temperature that I have. So this prediction probabilities guy, this is going to be a large matrix. This matrix is going to have, I'm doing row bind here. So each row is going to correspond to a new posterior iterate. I had 10,000 posterior iterates, so this matrix is going to have 1,000 rows. And those 1,000 rows are going to have 601 columns. Each of those 601 columns corresponds to a temperature that I'm choosing to predict at. And so I'm going to use an apply function to go through that matrix and calculate the quantiles for each temperature value that I want to predict at. And so that's where this 2 comes in. 1 is going to apply my function to each row. 2 is going to apply my function quantile to each column. So I want to apply it to each column. I'm going to calculate the quantile based on the data that I have in that matrix, my posterior iterates for the probabilities. I'm going to calculate the quantiles for each of those temperatures. And then I'm going to use that information to create three lines on a simultaneous line graph here. The middle one is the median line. That's the solid line. The upper one is the 95th percentile line. And so that's the highest I believe the probability could reasonably go. And the lowest I think the probability could reasonably go is my fifth percentile line, which is the lower one down here. And so this gets me graphically a set of predictions, reasonable predictions, what I think could happen uh, at every temperature from 32 degrees to 92 degrees. And you can see there's a whole host of temperatures in here where you might think where, where there is some chance of an O-ring failure, uh, of at least one O-ring failure, but not a phenomenally high chance. It could happen, it could not happen. When we're at fairly high temperatures, it's unlikely that any of the O-rings are going to fail. Um, we've got probabilities near zero, so that's probability of one or more O-rings failing. So it's unlikely if I'm up at 81 or more degrees that I'm going to see an O-ring failure. But if I'm down here around freezing, yeah, I'm almost certainly going to see an O-ring failure. This is what I wanted to talk to you about in terms of the O-ring data. What have we done? We have gone through and looked at the O-ring data itself.
and then two different models for fitting the o-ring data using bugs one centered one not centered and then we've gone through and we've run those models in r those models are standard logistic regression models like we've been talking about in the previous two lectures um, the most interesting pieces here for you to pay attention to are the graphing, uh, the ways that we can analyze these models graphically and what we can learn about them graphically, and looking at our um, open bugs model statements, this way of choosing priors, and we're going to come back to this more and more looking at regression modeling as Bayesian, uh, this way of choosing priors in terms of starting from some value that an expert can reasonably think about, the probability of seeing a failure at particular temperatures we might choose. So that's not too hard for an expert to think about in this case. It is harder for experts to think about the beta values. And so we want to move from a prior on things that experts can think about, like the probability of failure at given temperatures, to an induced prior on our model parameters based on the information that we can get from the expert on what the expert has an easier time think of, thinking about. Like I said, this is going to be a very common method for us to use in terms of eliciting prior information from experts for regression models, and we'll come back to that when we move into linear regression.